this is the third part of the lecture 7 of modern construction materials. We have been looking at the response of materials to stress. Until now, we have looked at how the material behavior when subjected to stress goes through stages of elastic, plastic and failure behavior. We discussed in the last uh, part brittle fracture which occurs in a sudden manner and without significant deformation. That is why we are concerned about brittle failure. Now, in this lecture we look at other cases which can cause brittle failure which are time dependent such as fatigue, creep and the very fast loading rates. In, uh, in the lead slides of uh, this lecture, I have uh, included some pictures of the ruins of the city of Vijayanagara near Hampi, where we can see stone that has withstood almost 500 years plus of um, loading for which it was designed for probably and the effect of environmental conditions over these centuries and uh, it has withstood well the uh, troubles inflicted by uh, time and loading. Incidentally, Vijayanagara was supposedly one of the largest cities uh, in its time in the world. It is located near the present Hampi in Karnataka, which is in the south of India. So, let us get back to the response of the materials that we are considering. First, let us look at fatigue failure. Fatigue is a type of failure that occurs in structures and elements which are subjected to dynamic fluctuating stresses. That is the stress, that is the stress is going up and down as a function of time. This happens in many structures such as in bridges, aircraft, machine components where we have stresses going up and down during the service life. Why it is of concern to us is that under these circumstances of cycling of stresses, the failure in the material occurs at a stress level lower than the strength, lower than the tensile or yield strength for a static load. Static load meaning that the stress monotonically increases over a short period of time that is what we use to characterize the tensile or the yield strength of a material. What we find now under fatigue loading where we have cycling of stresses over a long period of time, failure can occur at stress levels that are lower than the strength that we get from static or monotonic loading. Further of concern is that fatigue failure is brittle in nature, even in a ductile material such as in a metal, we can have fatigue failure occurring with almost no plastic deformation, very little plastic deformation before failure occurs, which means that fatigue failure is generally brittle. The process of fatigue failure, the mechanisms are in three stages. First, the crack initiates at a defect, a tiny crack at some point of high stress concentration. There are defects in materials, there can be tiny cracks forming due to the high stress concentration at these defects. The crack initiates there in the first stage. As the material now undergoes cyclic stresses, is subjected to cyclic stresses, this tiny crack starts propagating. Failure does not occur right then the crack is just propagating in a stable manner with each loading cycle the crack is propagating a little bit more. Finally, when the crack now has reached a large enough size, a critical size, the stress is high enough to cause sudden brittle failure that is the final failure stage. So, crack initiation occurs first followed by stable crack propagation and finally, sudden dramatic failure occurs. We see that reflected in this photo taken from Callister, where we have a fatigue failure surface of a bar subjected to fatigue loading and we find at the top here, at the top is where 
the crack would have initiated the crack would have initiated here probably there was a tiny surface defect which caused a higher stress concentration and over a period of time the crack propagated in a stable manner giving the shiny surface this light colored surface at the top. Then the critical size of the crack was reached and under probably in the final cycle sudden failure occurs shown by this dull fibrous texture indicating sudden failure in the metal we had the crack propagating through the section causing sudden failure. Fatigue failure can occur through a wide range of cyclic stresses. The stress could be going from compression to tension in a symmetric manner or it could have more of compression or more of tension as in this diagram we have more of tension little bit of compression and back to tension this cyclically occurring over a period of time or we can have random stress cycles they need not be as periodic and of the same shape as in curves a and b but we could have random cycles of any form occurring through some natural phenomena or some other mechanically induced phenomena. So, any type of cyclic stress can lead to fatigue failure over a long period of time and you should remember that when we talk about fatigue failure we are talking about failure occurring at stresses that are lower than the strength and also in a brittle manner. So, this stress under fatigue loading we can be significantly less than the strength that we obtain from a monotonic or a st static test. So, how do we take care of this in design? What do we do to understand the material and how it will behave under fatigue loading? What we do is go to what is called the S n curve, a curve showing stress amplitude on the y axis that is the stress over which the cycling is done and on the x scale we have the logarithmic cycles to failure the log of cycles to failure on the log scale. And we find that we will have a curve such as this, this is the curve for cases such as ferrous and titanium alloys where we have now the S n curve dropping that is as the number of cycles increase the stress amplitude that can be endured under fatigue loading drops and becomes flat. This flat part corresponds to a stress amplitude called the fatigue limit. Below this fatigue limit cyclic loading does not cause failure in these materials. So, one way of using this in design is to ensure that the stress amplitude in service under cyclic loading never exceeds the fatigue limit. So, you will have the element enduring many many cycles without failing. It could happen that in some cases we cannot use a stress that is that low, it stress has to be ab above the fatigue limit or we can have a case where the material does not have a well defined fatigue limit that the curve does not become flat like in the case of non ferrous alloys like we see here in this curve. We have the stress amplitude always dropping as a fu function of the life that it has to endure or the number of cycles to failure. So, in this case what we see is the stress amplitude that can be endured as a function of the different number of cycles always keeps decreasing. So, how is this used in design in two ways first if we know the number of cycles that the structure or element has to endure during its service life its useful life we can go from those number of cycles 
to this curve back to the y axis and find out what is the stress corresponding to that number of cycles. As long as the stress applied in service is less than this value then the failure life failure during its life is ensured. Okay. Again if I know the number of cycles that I, I will subject the material to in its life I go from those number of cycles to the SN curve of that particular material go back to the y axis and find out what is the stress amplitude that corresponds to these number of cycles. So, as long as the stress applied is less than this fatigue strength at n 1 cycles there will not be any failure due to fatigue in this situation. On the other hand if I know what is the stress that will be applied and that cannot be changed in design I can also find out what would be the fatigue life for the number of cycles that the material can endure. So, here I start off with the stress amplitude S 1 I go to this curve drop down and then it will tell me what would be the maximum number of cycles that can be endured under this stress amplitude or what is the fatigue life at the stress 1. So, these are two ways that the S n curve can be used in design or prediction of the life under fatigue. We see here in this uh, plot the S n curves for four different materials at the top we have 0.45 percent carbon steel with the S n curve having a flat part that is this is the fatigue life uh, this is the fatigue stress or the fatigue limit this is the fatigue limit as long as we are below this stress level this 0.45 percent carbon steel will not fail under fatigue. Whereas, in the case of aluminum alloy we find that a curve the curve has the shape which is always going down the curve is always going down. So, that means we have to define for each number of cycles that we design for we have to find out what is the stress level and ensure that that stress level is not exceeded. So, that failure does not occur within those number of cycles. We also find that polymers such as nylon and polymethyl methacrylate can be characterized by SN curves. In the case of nylon this is a particular nylon 6 we have an SN curve that is almost linearly dropping. In the case of polymethyl methacrylate we have a curve with a fatigue limit like what we saw in the 0.45 percent carbon steel. So, different materials can be characterized in terms of S n curves and these can be used in design to limit the stress that is applied on the material or alternatively it can be used to determine the fatigue life or the number of cycles that a material can endure under a certain fluctuating stress level. Another important aspect is that fatigue failure is probabilistic. We saw that fatigue failure is initiated by defects and these defects need not always occur in the same place and of the same dimensions in an element. The probability that a defect is large is not 0 nor 100 there is a certain probability. So, this probability determines how the failure will occur. When we look at fatigue test data we have a lot of scatter and this is because the defects that originate the fatigue failure vary in location and in size. Therefore, S n curves are often plotted in terms of probabilities like we see here from Callister the S n curves for a 70-75 T 6 aluminum alloy and the p value along given along with each curve is the probability of failure. So, if you want to ensure that the probability is very low say 10 percent at a certain number of cycles then you would take this curve the curve second from the bottom. 
this corresponds to a probability of failure of 0.1 or 10 percent. So, in this case this S n curve will give you a probability that only 10 percent can exceed this value when we use it in design. 0.99 will be the upper limit of the S n curve. What we find is that as the probability becomes smaller the lower probability that we can assume in design means that we have to go for an S n curve that is lower that is the stress that can be applied is lower when the probability of failure that we can accept is lower. Now, we move on to another time dependent failure that is that can be caused by creep in in fatigue failure what we saw is that the stress is cycled over a period of time. In creep we do not have a cycling of stress, but the stress is kept constant over a long period of time that is the reason why this is also called static fatigue whereas, the previous case that we discussed until now is called cyclic fatigue. Creep is the permanent deformation of a material under load as a function of time that is we sustain the load and we see that the strain will continue to increase beyond just the elastic or the instantaneous part. The curve below gives the different stages of creep. This is under a constant stress and a constant temperature. We will see later on that creep can be driven by temperature also. So, most curves for defining the creep behavior have to be given at a certain temperature. So, if when we look at the strain change as a function of time under a constant applied stress and constant temperature, we find that initially we will have an elastic part. As soon as the load is applied as a function of the stiffness there will be an elastic strain. Then we, though we are maintaining the stress the strain continues to increase with time. Here in the first stage we have a slow increase of strain here the increase is almost with a constant slope and then we have a very sudden large increase of strain leading to finally, rupture or failure. This is called the first stage where there is a gradual increase. This is the second stage where you have a steady state increase the slope is almost constant. Here. Then we have a third stage where the slope is increasing very very rapidly to give rupture in the third stage. So, what we saw is that in a typical creep curve the increase in strain under a constant load or stress is plotted as a function of time or log logarithm of time at constant temperature. We saw three stages that can be identified in the first stage or the primary stage the creep rate decreases with time the slope decreases with time. In stage 2 which is the secondary stage which is the longer stage creep is minimum and constantly increases with time the slope is almost constant. And in the third stage called the tertiary stage which is the final stage of creep the creep rate increases the slope increases rapidly with time until we have sudden failure of fracture occurring. We said a few minutes back that temperature drives creep and we see here the different stress strain stress time curves for different temperatures. The lower curve corresponds to a lower stress or a lower temperature. The next one if it is the same stress could be at a higher temperature say a medium temperature and the third one if the stress is the same could be a for a higher temperature. So, under the same stress what we find is the strain will increase more rapidly when the temperature increases. Okay. Failure will also now occur in a shorter period of time under creep when the temperature is higher. So, we can say that temperature somehow 
accelerates creep and therefore, we say that creep is a thermally activated process, it is driven by temperature. Higher the temperature, more will be the creep as if more load is being applied or more stress is being applied. We can identify some mechanisms of creep, say in metals, there are three mechanisms of primary creep. One is dislocation climb. So, we have here the dislocation that we have discussed in line defects and later. Instead of the dislocation moving this way along the slip plane, when we are applying tension, say we are applying tension this way, we will find that the dislocation climbs, the dislocation moves up vertically that causes a decrease in the section and an elongation. This is one of the mechanisms of creeping in metals. The other mechanism is that the vacancies which are inside that is again we are talking about defects. In this case these are line defects then vacancies are point defects. We have missing atoms or particles within the material. As now stress is applied and kept constant these vacancies start moving outward. The vacancies start flowing outward again decreasing the section because the vacancy or the gap now is on the outside and again you have creeping occurring. The third mechanism is that the grain boundaries start sliding against each other. Remember again that we looked at grain boundaries being areas of defect, these are called surface defects. So, the bonding between the atoms is not very strong in the grain boundaries. So, when we have a large sustained stress kept for long time, these grains start sliding against each other, realigning themselves and this gives rise to an increase in elongation along this direction, giving rise to creep strain. In the tertiary stage, what happens in metals is that cavities or voids start forming along the grain boundaries. We saw in the premier, previous stage that the grain boundaries start to slip and this gives rise to some strain and in the tertiary stage we start having voids or cavities forming along the grain boundaries. This is a form of damage that is occurring due to creep and you will see that as the grain boundary now has a void more stress has to be taken by the rest of the grain boundary to transfer the stress coming onto the element. This higher stress now increases creep and increases the possibility that the material can fail more easily. The cavitation also increases at an increasing rate and this further decreases the section. The local stresses increase and the creep rate becomes even higher. So, what we have is now a deviation from this secondary stage instead of the secondary stage continuing for a longer period of time here now damage has started to occur on the grain boundaries, there is accumulation of damage, finally the damage of the voids are so high that failure occurs and this gives rise to the tertiary phase or the final stage of creep response. Materials other than metals also can undergo creep, materials such as ceramics, concrete, glass, wood can also fail under sustained stress at values significantly lower than that required to cause failure in conventional static quasi static strength test. Quasi static means it is not very very slow, but in the range of tests that are done in the laboratory. We look at couple of examples here, on the left we have a soda lime glass plates that are subjected to tension. These glass plates have different uh, types of surface defects, C f in the plot denotes the floor depth ranging from 5 microns to about 20 microns and the for each of these floor depth we have a curve relating the stress at failure to the time it took to cause failure. 
the stress at failure is given as in absolute terms as the tensile strength. So, how we look at this graph is that if we wanted the glass plate to survive for a certain amount of time, the stress applied should not increase should not be more than this. So, if we go from here and go back, we find that this would be the stress that we should not exceed. And this is now a function of the floor depth. What we see is larger the depth, lower is the stress that the material can take for a longer period of time. So, creep is also dependent on the surface defects in the case of a brittle failure. Here for wood, we have a similar graph, but instead of the absolute value of stress, we have a stress ratio, one being the strength at static monotonic loading and the stress at failure is now given normalized to that value as a stress ratio. So, again we have the case that wood, now this case this is Douglas fir wood beams failing at different times when the stress that is kept sustained varies. So, at 7 hours we have the material failing at a stress of say 0.95 that of the strength, but if we want the to know the stress ratio at failure when the load has to be maintained at least for 30 days we find that it is not more than about 0.8. In practice we want we would want the stress to be even lower, so that the life of the beam is much larger. We want the life of a structure to be much more than a few days. So, what we do is we would extrapolate this curve and find out what the stress value should be for many many years probably less than 0.7 or 0.6. So, as long as the stress is kept less than that, we will not have failure due to creep. Thirdly, we look at how failure is affected by the loading rate. First, we looked in this lecture at fatigue loading, where we cycle the load. Next, we looked at a sustained load for creep. Now, what happens when the loading rate changes? We find in general that the tensile strength of a material is higher at a higher loading rate. That is when we load very fast, the tensile strength actually goes up. For metals, this is reflected as an increase in the yield strength with an increase in the strain rate and it also raises the stress strain curve. It pushes the stress strain curve up. This also is related to the microstructure. We find that metals with the BCC structure are more sensitive to strain rate than FCC metals. That is a material, a metal with a BCC structure will change its tensile strength more as the strain rate is changing. These are curves from Young et al for mild steel at room temperature and different strain rates. The values that you see here are the strain rates going from 300 per second down to 8.5 times 10 to minus, minus 4 seconds and we find that as the strain rate increases. So, strain gate strain rate is increasing that is we are loading faster and faster and we find that the stress strain curve is now pushed up the yield strength and the peak strength are pushed up. So, there is an effect of time in many ways on failure going from failure at low stresses compared to monotonic value in the case of fatigue and possibly creep. And in the case of loading rates be changing, we saw that when the strain rate is fast, we have an increase in the tensile strength. So, these are the references as in uh, the different lectures. There is a lot of literature on mechanical properties of civil engineering materials 
and in, in all the libraries I am sure there are enough materials, material that you can refer to. You have to look to understand the fundamental nature, you have to look at textbooks that cover material science aspects and materials engineering aspects such as what I have listed here. The, the bottom three books are basically looking at the material science aspects, Callister looks more at the fundamental nature and then we have uh, the book of Young et al looking more in this from at civil engineering materials. I finished this lecture on a lighter note, this is a cartoon that I saw a couple of days back. This is a cartoon of Tiger asking why rubber bands that he has with them do not uh, stretch but break and his friend says that they have lost their elasticity. So, poor Tiger is now emptying the box and trying to find the elasticity to put it back and he does not seem to find it and they are perplexed. So, they do not know what has happened to the elasticity, but I hope that you have gotten some idea of what happens in the microstructure why materials stop being elastic and go on to plastic ductile failure and can even have brittle failure sometimes. So, that is the end of this uh, relatively long lecture on how materials respond to stress. We looked at the transition from elastic through ductile yielding shearing type failure to final rupture and brittle failure. We also looked at cases where failure occurs at stresses lower or higher than the normal uh, strength values that we obtain in a lab. Fatigue and creep can cause failure at stresses lower than the strength and we also saw that how loading rates which are very fast can increase the tensile strength, the material can endure higher strength than in a monotonic test. In the next lecture, we look at failure theories, how we can anticipate failure as a function of the stress state uh, in a material and use that appropriately in design. Thank you very much. Yeah.